So you're a citizen of the Soviet Union in the early to mid-1900s. You're just the average peasant that's just trying to get by and live your life in a country that's had a very chaotic history recently. The Russian Revolution just happened in 1917, so now the Soviet Union was a thing, and you were now a comrade in this new thing called communism. As it turns out, turning over everything, farming, agriculture, manufacturing jobs, to a few greedy politicians thousands of miles away, didn't work out so well, which resulted in multiple famines with plenty of universal suffering to go around. So you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm starving, I can't get my hands on any goods, but hey, under communism, everyone owned everything. And if everyone owned everything, then no one really owns anything. And if no one owned anything, then surely I could just take the stuff I wanted from others since they didn't own it? That wouldn't be considered theft now, would it? So everyone, quite literally everyone, stole what they could. Many for survival, many for their own personal gain. Alright, so you're a thief now, and a bunch of people you know are thieves too. And since it's pretty self-evident by now that your comrades in the government aren't going to put food on the table for you, and your new communist jobs aren't cutting it, well, you might as well partner with your fellow thieves to steal more than you could steal on your own. So that's what millions of people did. And this perfect storm of revolution, famine, war, suffering of the early to mid-1900s resulted in an estimated 7 million gangs around Russia. And what did your comrades in the government do? You petty thieves are no better than the greedy capitalists and are therefore enemies of communism. So into the gulag you go. The Soviet Union's giant network of labor camps that a shocking number of people in the West don't really know much about. So the petty thieves were sent to the gulags, along with the more hardened criminals, and any of the opposition to the people in power, and along with people who disagree with the government, and pretty much everyone else too. And it was in this network of labor camps, death camps, that the Russian Mafia was born, bred, organized, and homogenized. And when the Vovizakone, thieves in law or thief within the law, were released from the gulags, they would turn Russia into the biggest mafia state in the world, the superpower of crime, according to Boris Yeltsin, the first president of modern-day Russia. This is the economics of the Russian Mafia, one of the most unique organized crime groups in history that would give the American Mafia and the Yakuza a run for their money. But first, we gotta thank our sponsor. Look, the holidays are coming up. Everyone is taking it easy, everyone starts showing up a little late to work, slacking off, operating in this holiday mode. Hey, Papa, what did I do? Is it Merry Christmas or what? But I'll let you in on a little secret. The successful people out there that are making the money you want, that have the life that you want, have already mapped out their 2021, and they're using this opportunity to get ahead while everyone else is caught off guard. And guess what? They don't have just money goals. All of them have health goals. Why? Because it's kind of hard to make money if you're obese, tired all the time, and you can't make smart decisions. This is where Magic Spoon comes in. I loved eating cereal as a kid, until I found out how disgustingly unhealthy it was. But with Magic Spoon, you get the exact same sugary deliciousness without the sugar with 11 grams of protein and only 3 net carbs. It's so good that I finished multiple boxes already, with my favorite flavors being coca, which tastes like your favorite chocolate cereal, and their fruity flavor. You are already gonna gain weight this holiday season, so why not just skip all that nonsense and start 2021 strong? So in the spirit of that and for the first time ever, you can build your very own variety box. Pick from my favorite flavors to frosted, blueberry, plus brand new flavors including peanut butter and cinnamon. Build your own custom box today by going to magicspoon.com slash jaketran. And be sure to use promo code jaketran to get free shipping at checkout. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product that it's backed by a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund you your money no questions asked. Pause the video right now and build your own custom box at magicspoon.com slash jaketran with code jaketran for free shipping. Much like the American Mafia and the Yakuza, the Russian Mafia is very much a byproduct of Russia's history. But this is also what makes the Russian Mafia, also known as the Vori or Thieves, very different from other crime groups. For example, La Cosa Nostra, the Italian-American Mafia, and the Yakuza were both extremely strict when it came to who could join. For La Cosa Nostra, for the most part, you have to be Italian or Sicilian to get into the inner circle. For the Yakuza, you have to be Japanese or you'll forever be considered an outsider. We've done video essays on both that you can check out by the way. But the Russian Mafia is a lot more progressive, inclusive compared to their Mafia counterparts. Because they were joined together under the banner of being against the government and authority, 
they welcomed all the ethnic groups that came from the surrounding Soviet states. States like Armenia, Ukraine, Georgia, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and more. With the main requirement being that you're a hardened criminal who's been in the gulag or prison multiple times. So if you're an SJW that cares about diversity in the workplace, you should consider applying for the Russian mob. The Italian-American mafia is well known for its rigid pyramid structure, with a godfather at the top and underboss below him, captains under that that manage the soldiers and associates who run the mafia's day-to-day -day operations, like a healthy running corporation. Not the Russian mafia though. Time and time again, American cops would try to fit the Russian mob into a pyramid shape, only to find that they were something completely different. Russian organized crime was more of a decentralized economy of criminals than just a few big crime families. As we mentioned earlier, Russian organized crime may not necessarily be just Russian. It also may not be all that organized either, and it grew to encompass more than just crime, with the central thing tying them together being the distinctive way they operate. It's not a gang, it's a bunch of Facebook friends, as one European cop put it. But at a street level, they do have a loose structure. Keep in mind that these positions aren't always official titles and vary. There's the Pokken who's the boss of the gang, kind of like the godfather who controls everything. Hey, Papa! The Pokken typically controls a few criminal cells. So you heard him, Patan. Now you get these boxes out of sight. Each cell is made up of Bratuk, or soldiers. Beneath those soldiers are interns or errand boys looking to move up the ranks called Shishtorka, with a captain of the cell called Brigadier, or Brigadier that reports to the boss. But to really understand the Russian mob, to really understand how they make money, their rackets, how they got so big, how they got so deep in bed with the Russian government to where it becomes hard to distinguish them apart, we have to go back in time. Before the Russian Revolution and Communism in 1917, Russia was ruled by monarchs, kings that they called czars. Under the czars, there were already a good amount of gangs, but they weren't nearly as powerful, influential, or cohesive as they would grow to be. Then came the revolution. Nothing in the world is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. The Bolsheviks pointed the finger at the greedy capitalists and the petty thieves like we talked about earlier. They took power by force. So the only way they were able to maintain their power was to rule with an iron fist. And to rule with an iron fist to climb those ruthless ranks, you needed to have a more flexible sense of morality. And by needing a flexible sense of morality, they attracted the not-so-petty criminals to pursue profitable careers in government. This was the very beginnings of Russia's long unholy alliance between organized crime and government. Again, that perfect storm of revolution, famine, war, suffering led to that explosion of 7 million gangs around Russia with all the crime that came with it. And then came the gulags. In the Soviet Union, if you so much as made a joke about Stalin or the government, that would be 10 years, 25 years in the gulag for you. By the end of it all, estimates say around 18 million people were imprisoned in the Soviet gulag system of forced labor camps, giving a certain guy with a certain small mustache a run for his money. But the thing you have to understand is that gulags weren't just a tool to keep criminals and political threats at bay. See, if the Soviet Union were to beat the evil Americans, the government would need a lot of labor. So the government used gulags as both a state-building and economic tool, and as a psychological tool. The goal wasn't to just punish those no-good criminals, but rather to exploit them economically in the name of the collective good, of course, and to transform them psychologically. Need a power plant, a ditch dug, move some prisoners around and have them get to work. So understandably, criminals, gang members, and the like that were already not fond of the government for not providing for them, only grew to hate society even more while in prison. So they banded together, helped each other out, stole and committed crimes together. And just like how every war veteran talks about how their teammates are like brothers to them, because of the life and death experiences they went through together, the extreme conditions of the gulags cemented the bond between these prisoners in arms. And as prisoners got moved around different camps to relieve overcrowding, prevent prison fights, or to labor on new economic goals, these criminals within the law intermingled exchange ideas, tactics, and bonded. And this thief culture, this Vori gangster subculture spread. Their signature tattoos emerged within the prison walls. In Russian prisons, your life story is written on your body in tattoos. Each with their own symbolic meaning, Stars on his knees means he'd never kneeled before anyone. Now, if you're thinking that Yakuza tattoos look way better, that's because they do. But the Vori had to make do with what they had in Soviet prisons. 
so don't be too hard on them. With their sworn code being that a true thief, a true vor, never helps the government, never enlists as a soldier, never helps the prison guards. Or in other words, the Vori completely reject legitimate society and only operates in their own criminal society. And it really was an underground society. They held their own courts, their own trials, all governed by their code of thieves and honor. But this dedicated criminal culture was soon changed. Because there were so many prisoners, tons of innocents and a smaller population of actual criminals, the guards needed help keeping everyone under submission. Running a forced labor camp is hard. And just like the government, you needed people with a flexible sense of morality to help out these poor prison guards. The good news is that this is a prison. You already have a bunch of tough, hardened criminals at your disposal. So what did the guards do? They enlisted the war's most capable mafia members to keep their political and petty criminals productive. The more traditionalist gangsters that didn't believe in helping the guards weren't a fan of these criminals. So there was a gang war between the two factions. The guards helped the side that helped them and they won the war. And this new generation of gang members would further cement the collaboration between the government and the thieves. And when the gulags were disbanded around 1960, these collaborator criminals would be set free to plunder the Soviet Union. They got their training in prison, and now it was time to take on the state and economy. While all of this was happening, the Soviet economy was suffering as usual. Still a new breed emerged to supplement the Soviet economy, black market entrepreneurs. Secret underground capitalists that smuggled goods into the country and sold them, among other things. Since these black market barons operated outside of the government, they couldn't just call the police or sue if something went wrong. So who did they hire? The gangsters. The gangsters were offered protection to these entrepreneurs, for a price of course. And over time, they got to see how the secret capitalists worked, how they lived, and they came to see that they could do that too. The more they collaborated with the entrepreneurs, the more they learned about entrepreneurship. The more they collaborated with the state, the more they learned about politics, which would set them up for their next evolution, the violent entrepreneurs. As they developed their business acumen, these gangsters saw a huge gap in the marketplace. Courts were extremely corrupt back then, even if you didn't get cheated by the judge, enforcing a judge's rule wasn't easy. And you can't forget about the court system if you're a black market entrepreneur. See, one of the main purposes of government is to protect people's private property and to settle disputes. He owes me money he stole from me. He signed a contract saying he would do this, but he didn't. And when the government fails to provide the service, people will naturally turn to other service providers that will. So the gangsters came in and created what's called enforcement partnerships where gangs will offer business owners the protection the government failed to give them. You couldn't be sure if the government will follow through to protect you, but you can be pretty sure that these gangsters will use any amount of violence they need to earn that 50% of the dispute in question, to build their reputation, to build their brand name as the best enforcers. Or in other words, these Russian gangsters learn how to monetize their violence, to become the violent entrepreneurs, the honest criminals. This culture of working with honest criminals was quickly interwoven into the very fabric of society, the economy, and politics. And then came the fall of the Soviet Union from 1988 to 1991, which shot the thieves into the stratosphere. Russia was in complete turmoil in every regard during the 1990s. Laws were being rewritten on the fly, so they were confusing and contradicted each other. Policing courts were stretched thin. Russia's stock, bond, and currency markets collapsed. Their currency was hyperinflated by 2,500%. A third of Russians were living in poverty by 1999. It was a mess. So the government was in desperate need of money to pull them out. So what did they do? They started selling the state's assets, which included everything the government owned. Shops, restaurants, small businesses, large businesses, supplies, raw materials, MiG-29 fighter jets for $23 million, which would later be known as the privatization of Russia. And who was ready cash in hand to buy these assets? Well, it definitely wasn't the average comrade being that it took a month's wage to buy a tire the state was auctioning off. No, it was the corrupt officials, insiders, black market entrepreneurs that would later be known as the Russian oligarchs, and of course, the Russian Mafia, who were rolling in cash from their previous violent entrepreneurship. And the lines between politics, business, and crime grew hazier and hazier as Russian organized crime played a key role in the country's next evolution. And with all this newfound territory and opportunities, 
The Russian Mafia spent the 90s violently expanding and sinking its grip into society. This was a decade of drive-by shootings, car bombs, and the virtual death of whole industries. And in 1994, President Yeltsin declared that Russia was the biggest mafia state in the world. Once Putin took over and became the president of Russia, he took back the government's monopoly on violence and is widely credited for taming the Russian mafia. But that's not the whole picture. See, Putin had ties to organized crime when he was working as the deputy mayor of St. Petersburg. By now, the gangs had already established their boundaries after the 90s. They knew that Putin was the real deal and that more violence would be bad for business. So the claim is that there's an unspoken contract, a hidden deal between the state and the mafia that as long as they don't cause a public disturbance, as long as they're discreet, as long as they settle scores and assassinations in private, and as long as they cut government officials in on the action, the government won't bother them. Sure, there'll be some arrests here and there, but nothing major. I am not in Russia, so I can't comment on if this is still the case myself, but that is the claim. In 2010, a leak claimed that bribery alone totals an estimated $300 billion a year. And much like the Yakuza, the romantic image of the hardened, tattooed, gulag Russian gangster continues to live on. But in practice, today's Russian mafia are more of criminal businessmen, economic gangsters that span places like Eastern Europe, Spain, New York, and are involved in everything from petty theft to billion dollar money laundering to legal businesses and investments as well. So you know the bowl of cereal that I poured in the beginning of the video? Well, I finished it, so we are gonna have some more just for you guys and because it's really good. Not as much this time, just a little. Get that nice cereal ASMR for you guys. Yes. Now that, that is out of the way. Another video that you guys have been requesting a lot lately on the Russian Mafia, so I hope you guys enjoyed it. The Russian Mafia is not so well known as like the Yakuza or uh, the Italian American Mafia. So information for this one was a little bit harder to find. As you can see, we are in a new set today. I think this microphone is slowly dragging down. We're gonna work with it. So we're in a new set and you would have known about this new set if you followed me on Instagram at jtrend.io where we post behind the scenes stuff, day in the life kind of stuff, memes, cool quotes that I share and find when I like study and read stuff. So yeah, don't miss out, jtrend.io. If you want to support the channel financially, of course we have our sponsor, Magic Spoon, which I very much enjoy eating. This is the blueberry flavor. Uh, I don't think I like it as much as the cho uh, chocolate and fruity flavor, but it's still very good. I'm very excited to try their new flavors though, especially cinnamon, because I really, really like cinnamon. And you can get your custom variety pack at magicspoon.com slash jaketran with co coupon code jaketran for free shipping, supporting the channel financially. So if you enjoyed it, make sure you click that like button and make sure you subscribe for more video essays just like this one every single week on the most provocative stuff in the world of business. Of course, if you want uh, video notifications for when new videos come out, you can either click the bell icon below or you can sign up for our email notification list down in the description below because sometimes the bell doesn't work. If you are new to this channel and you want more crime videos like this, we do videos on like crime, power, money, business. Wow, all right, this is really sagging. And We've already done one on the Yakuza and the Mafia, so you can check that out with the cards at the end of this video or in the video description below. That is gonna wrap it up. Thank you so much for sitting through all these shameless plugs. You've been awesome, I've been Jake, stay dangerous out there, and I will see you guys in the next one.